There's this plucky little podcaster that you probably have never heard of, but his name is uh, Joe Rogan. On his podcast, he interviewed a famous YouTuber called Derek. Actually, his YouTube channel is called uh, More Plates, More Dates. It's a long story as to why it's called that, so we just won't get into it. But Derek creates a lot of bodybuilding and hormone-related content and has, honestly, a massive following. In that recent podcast, they discussed creatine and said some pretty baffling things. So I thought I would touch on the science as we cover multiple claims by the infamous Joe Rogan and the broad-shouldered Derek. Let's get into it. Have yeah. you seen the studies on creatine and performance with uh, yeah. sleep deprivation? Very hey, what's interesting. It? Another thing that not being tested for, which I don't think it should be, but like creatine at adequate doses... Interestingly, for years, we've all been told, take your five grams and you're good. But what's often not talked about is the fact that that dosage is not going to be widespread, the optimal one for every single person. You will likely achieve muscle saturation with that dose, but it doesn't mean you're going to get the full suite of benefits depending on your genetics, how much you weigh, muscle mass, right. metabolism. So right. some five of, grams for a 140 pound person versus a 240. Yeah, pound person. so like so, some studies have found uh, increased benefits up to like 20 grams a day. Okay, let's put on the brakes here because there's already two things to discuss. One. Joe, that's the bald guy with the uh, unknown podcast, very briefly mentions that creatine is beneficial for sleep deprivation. Did he pull that out of somewhere unpleasant? No. There's uh, some evidence that's true, dating back actually quite a few years. However, a very recent study took a more in-depth look in that context and also identified benefits in people who were sleep deprived. Fascinatingly, while we generally think of creatine as a supplement that needs to build up in our tissues, this study only gave a single dose and showed benefit. So a uh, real quick takeaway is that if you know that you'll be sleep deprived on a particular night, consider creatine to help you through the next day, especially if it requires some level of cognitive work. The second thing was mentioned by Derek, the uh, non-bald guy, saying that a typical five grams recommended to people may not be enough because of a person's size, genetics, and so on may play a factor. I will say, while it's true that five grams might be insufficient for some people, it'll be sufficient for the vast majority of people, at least from a physical performance perspective, as Derek mentioned, saturating the musculature. He then mentions that some studies use up to 20 grams per day. I would push back against this uh, slightly, not because I don't think that there might be something to that. In fact, I said the very same thing a year ago in this video on creatine, but I also mentioned there's no actual evidence beyond the fact that some studies use 20 grams per day and show effectiveness. That doesn't actually prove that there's an additional benefit over five grams. We would need specific studies to tease out those differences. So it's a possibility, but it's not backed by the appropriate science yet. And then there's two types, right? There's creatine monohydrate, and then there's another creatine. What is the other one? There's different formats, but some are like HCL is essentially just bound to um, HCL instead of monohydrate, which could be more tolerable for somebody who gets GI distress from monohydrate. Mm. Thought to be, you know, water solubility and other things. But in general, monohydrate is the one that has the most literature supporting it, is tried and true, is cheaper, easier to access. Yeah, so they're discussing different chemical formulas of creatine. They look like this. They're similar, but are bound to a water molecule or a hydrochloric acid. Overall, creatine monohydrate is definitely the more readily available one. It tends to be cheaper, and it's equally effective as the HCL formulation evidenced in this study. There might be some benefits of alternate versions of creatine compared to the popular monohydrate formulation because monohydrate can cause some stomach discomfort, but you can also just uh, avoid that by spreading consumption throughout the day or using a micronized version. I took that from my extensive research I did in my book that I wrote on creatine. I don't sell it anymore, but it is well-sourced. 
Only way to get it now is through the Physionic Insiders, along with full access to all my work linked in the description. Don't tell me you didn't see that plug coming. Anyway, the takeaway here is to just buy the cheapest creatine that you can find. Usually that's creatine monohydrate. This next one is a meat lover's envy and a plant-based nightmare. So you have how much meat per day? Multiple pounds. Multiple? Yeah. Like cooked away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Huh. I probably eat at least three pounds of meat a day. Hmm. Yeah. yeah you might be getting... I forget how many pounds of meat you need to saturate creatine stores, or at least the equivalent of five grams, but you'd probably still benefit from trying supplementing more. So that's a lot of meat. Uh, it does depend on the meat, too. I had a tough time finding reputable sources for this, but according to the University of Delaware, which we all know is the Harvard of Delaware, they state that beef, pork, and several types of fish provide between 1.4 and 2.3 grams of creatine per pound. So... By those numbers, Joe, that's the bald guy with the minuscule podcast, is probably getting over five grams just from food. However, for those that have asked me in the past, if they eat meat, do they still need to supplement? The answer is likely yes, unless you're eating a majority meat diet. The takeaway here is that you need to be supplementing with creatine as you are unlikely to be getting enough from food alone. One of the most slept on supplements for sure. I think it kind of got, uh, I don't know, like l not as much attention as it deserves. Maybe more recently it's gotten a bit more hype because of some of the literature around its cognitive effects and whatnot, but it's like super useful for a myriad of things. Okay, this is merely opinion, but I disagree. Creatine has gotten a ton of attention for many years. I think it's one that's been discussed a lot and many people know about it now. At least people in the fitness space, which is a lot of people. I could be biased because I'm always exposed to content on it and studies on it, but that's the way that I see it. Actually, what's your impression? Did you already know about creatine? If not, I completely failed to introduce it in this video, so I royally screwed up and you're completely confused on what we're even talking about. Well, it's a molecule produced by your body and we don't produce enough to saturate our cells. So many people, although not all, benefit from supplementing with it as a series of proposed health and performance benefits as we'll discuss next. What is the mechanism for it giving you a cognitive uh, enhancing benefit? I think it's thought to be like local energy production in the brain. So some people uh. genetically or as they age or what have you have deficiencies in the capacity to produce ATP. And if you can like backfill it with like a readily available source of phosphocreatine, then you could basically get it to baseline of where it should be. I'm not going to go full physionic on you and dive too deep into this, but a brief re-explanation of what Derek, the guy with the hair, uh, said. It's true that as we age, our cells can become less able to generate cellular energy, known as ATP. In such a case, creatine can act as a reservoir of energy by holding on to a critical molecule called a phosphate. When creatine is holding onto a phosphate, it's called phosphocreatine, which is what Derek mentioned. Phosphocreatine can donate phosphates to spent ATP molecules called ADP and return them to their fully energized ATP molecule. It's basically a backup energy system. There's way, way more to get into for creatine, but I'll leave it to my other content to get into those details. People that are on a vegan diet, like what what are their creatine levels like? Oh, not good enough for sure. There's no way, right? No, it's impossible. Even if you're somebody who eats a lot of meat, you might think you're good, but unless you're eating multiple pounds a day, it's unlikely that you've saturated stores. They make a passing comment about people using a vegan diet or primarily plant-based diet and how it's impossible for them to have sufficient creatine levels. In fact, studies have shown this by switching people to a vegetarian diet. And even that less restrictive diet, people experience a reduction in bodily stores of creatine. So yes, it's likely even more important for people who don't eat much meat to consume creatine, assuming that they want the benefits of creatine. Overall, Although Joe spreads 
a lot of bad information. Fortunately, he has a minuscule podcast listened to by eh, two or three guys in Florida. I think this exchange with Derek here was actually pretty good. The takeaway is that creatine is a worthy supplement to consider for a number of reasons from sleep deprivation, physical performance, and cognitive benefits. But the intricacies of creatine extend way beyond what I shallowly covered in this video. There's so much cool research surrounding creatine that I begin detailing here. I promise you haven't heard many of the things that I mentioned in these videos right here. See you there.